24. Yes, we're taking it slow today with our next guest, Brooke McCallery. Welcome to the show, by the way. Thank you. Now, this is all about slowing down your life, your home, decluttering your life, because we have so many possessions. We are so busy with our phones and our jobs, and we have to work extra hard because of the economy. So talk to us about this whole slow movement, first of all. How did you first get into this? So, well, slow is really about quality over quantity in everything. And I think that sounds nice and neat, but the reality is that it's sort of complicated. The, the irony is that it's complicated to get there. But I discovered slow living when I was diagnosed with postnatal depression, actually mm -hmm. after our second baby was born. And I was not a slow person. I was very fast, I was very mindless, I was kind of going at things 150%, and I was forced to slow down. Okay, and it's all detailed here in this book, uh, Slow, Simple Living for a Frantic World. And when I saw this, uh, immediately what came to my mind as well was the uh, 2004 book, In Praise of Slow by Carl, Carl Honore. One of the things that that book looked at as well was when you go out for a meal and you have the time. In Europe, they spend like three or four hours just sitting there, uh, course after course, really just with not a care in the world, right? So I think we could take a page from that book as well. Exactly. It's just choosing to slow down in whatever we're doing, having a meal, having a conversation, um, doing a chore. Or, you know, mm -hmm. just slowing down and paying attention to what we're doing rather than thinking about the 15 other things that we could be doing. For me, when I get home, it's the phone. I, I always try to read when I get home. I, I have a big book series uh, collection, and I try to make time for that, but I can never put the phone down. Right. And so wh where would someone that has that issue start? How do you tackle the phone, for one thing, as that device that we're always tethered to? Yeah, well, we're carrying our offices around in our pockets, essentially. Yeah. So my advice is always to create boundaries. And for me, at my, in my home, it's a screen-free bedroom. Bedroom. So it screens, phones, nothing is allowed in the bedroom. A screen-free dining table. And then also to have a screen-free period of time every day. Be that first thing in the morning, last thing at night, or even a period over the weekend. And I think that just gives us boundaries within which we can have that downtime without the constant influx of information. And that's such a key issue when it comes to kids as well, oh, right? Absolutely. Okay, yeah. let's go through some main points here. You say declutter and de-own. Now, uh, despite the uh, obvious nature of decluttering, uh, w you know, because I think we lump it in sometimes into to a, a a main category, but what are the actual specifics? How can we actually tackle decluttering and de-owning our life? Well, I think de-owning is the second step. We all know what decluttering is. It's been a thing for a few years. Mm -hmm. But de-owning is then looking at why we feel the need to acquire and own and keep and, and collect and doing something about those stories that we're telling ourselves. So uh, if we're shopping, we find ourselves shopping, figuring out why we're constantly feeling like we need to buy and then doing things to remove the temptation. So you could have a 30 day do not buy list. You can hmm. remove your credit card information from online stores. There you go. Things like that that really help you just take that additional step before buying stuff will help you not only de-own, but then it avoids the need to declutter again. What about if you're a pack rat and you have all this stuff for sentimental value and you just don't want to get rid of it? Well, I think then that's okay. I mean, it's okay to, to keep things if they bring you joy, if they bring you happiness. I think the problem is when we keep them mindlessly. Okay. So it's really questioning, do I want all of this or is there one or two things in amongst this stuff that I actually want and can I then let go of the rest? But I think that sentimental clutter is possibly the last thing we should tackle because it's tough. Okay, and uh, disconnect or reconnect, what can you tell us about that? Uh, similarly with our, with our tech, if we can just create some boundaries around it because when we're constantly fighting the influx of information um, with our phones, we don't have time to sit down and have a conversation, look into people's eyes, really appreciate what's happening. Yeah. So by switching off, just taking some time every day, you're able to slow down. And you always, I mean, we always hear the, the term, you know, uh, work-life balance, but you say forget all that, yeah. right? Yeah. Throw I that out the window. Absolutely, get rid of it. It's a myth. I think it's really harmful because it makes us feel guilty about not having nailed everything every day. So instead of balancing in our day-to-day, -day, I like to think about the idea of tilting. So you tilt into the one thing you're meant to be doing, be that work or playing with your kids or having a conversation with someone, and acknowledge that that means you're not doing anything else and let go of the guilt that comes with it. And then balance can be uh, you know, a six-month kind of optic rather than a day-to-day -day thing. Do I feel balanced over six months? Yes, great. And if not, then you can start to look at it at what you can do to change mm -hmm. without feeling that constant pressure to, to maintain daily balance. So do that self-evaluation always and uh, just be open-minded and always present about everything, right? Yeah, it's just intention. It's just turning up. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much, Brooke. The uh, book is Slow, Simple Living for a Frantic World and slowyourhome.com is where we can find more That's about me. you. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks for joining Thanks us. Thanks for having me. All right.